Well, well that's a, an intro uh, to who Josephine Baker was. Is, is that from a film that she made, Alana? Yes, that's from a film that she made in the 1930s called Princess Tam Tam. It's a French film. Uh, yes, she, she was an actress as well as a dancer, but she's mostly known as, um, as a dancer. Um, the person who brought the Charleston to Europe, basically. But um, yes, she's, a, she's, she's not just a dancer. She's an actress, she's a singer, she's an activist, she's many things and um, a real star in a way, like she's yeah. a big one of, and the most photographed women in her time. So let's start at sort of the beginning for her because she was born in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, a very segregated St. Louis. And at age seven, she was sent to work. She was still in school, but she was also sent to work as a domestic worker for uh, a, a white family. For many white families, actually, she went on, on from job to job, really. She was sort of put by her mother to work in many white families because she came from a very, very poor background. And um, yes, that was her life. She went on and off. It's, uh, the film shows clips of when it was actually pretty violent in some, in, in, in it, it, it was pretty violent. I mean, she, Josephine talks about it with a pretty dark, she has very dark souvenirs about it and her- you, you tell this one story, Alana, about how she broke some dishes in the dishwasher and she was sort of brutally punished. Yes, the, um, the lady she was working for put her hands in the boiling water to punish her. That was just one of the, one of the punishments she had, but you know, she, she sort of remembers her childhood as um, she has, a, she, Josephine is someone who rewrote, told about her life a lot of times in many different ways. So in each souvenir, in each book that she wrote and each souvenir, she raises something else. So we sort of piled up to a sort of, um, in the documentary, we try to come up with uh, some of the most, um, how to say, um, most, uh, yeah, we, 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 you do we a great do a job of cutting, yeah, you do a great yeah. job of cutting her life down to, to uh, of explaining the, the arc of her life. So she drops out of school age 12, but she gets married age 13 and then divorced soon afterward and then married again yes. at 15. Yes, well, actually, she has a very conflicting relationship with her mother. So we presume, I mean, ex experts presume that she was trying to uh, run away from home uh, in whatever she, way she could. And what she did was to run away um, first with this boy at 13, when she was 13. It didn't last long uh, because she was abused. Um, and then she went on to um, work in black vaudeville shows through in, a, in a, um, shows that were moving from from uh, state to state and she was she was sort of uh, a street performer with them yeah. in St. Louis she was someone else when she was born it was in 1906 and then so right. she worked as a performer a street performer in St. Louis and then she made it to New York where she worked on sort of vaudeville shows there Yes, well, in New York, it was pretty different because that was where things were happening, really. The Harlem shows, the Harlem uh, jazz clubs were really, really popular at the time. And, um, and uh, she was actually, she really went there to be part of them because uh, it, was, it was so popular that even, even white folk at the time would go and um, uh, sort of adventure themselves in Harlem late at night. And it was important to be seen by them, apparently at the time. And um, so Josephine um, tried by every means she could to be part of the shows, yes. And, and she was a sort of comedic actress who, was, who would do the sort of jokes at the end of the chorus line, pretend that right, she didn't do exactly. the she was, a, she was a mischief, mis, mischievous character. She was, a, she was very funny and she crossed her eyes and she, she did funny faces and people sort of, uh, she, she did what was not so expected. She, she was, a, um, she knew how to draw attention to her. Yes. Yeah. And, and so she, speaking of that, she was spotted and um, invited to go to Paris to be part yes, of a, well, a group that was going there. Exactly. She was spotted by um, an American producer that lived in Paris who went to, um, who went to New York to, to select people who would be part of a show 
an African-American show in Paris that was seen at the time as a big novelty. So people were sort of expecting this show as something very modern that could sort of hit um, the Europe's, uh, you know, intelligentsia in a sort of, uh, uh, you know, that would, sh that would shock them in a way. That that's what they wanted, but actually, um, they didn't actually know what they wanted themselves. They sort of had their own ideas what, of what these Harlem shows would look like. So when they actually came to France. So Josephine uh, got on a ship with his group of people exactly. and left America and, right. Left America on a boat uh, with the crew. Um, and um, that was the major trip of her life. But she, she didn't realize at the time that she would probably make all her life, do all her, the rest of her life in France, but that's actually what happened. Yes, it was in 1925 and she fell in love with Paris. Yeah. So, so she um, ended up being part of this review, um, being the star of the review, and we have some footage of it. Um, shall we show the uh, brief yes. clip? Blinded by the blazing stage lights, possessed by. So Josephine kind of took the Parisians, the staid Parisians by storm. One of the performances in that show, she was she was topless, which was quite shocking, I think, at the time. What, what did the French make of her? In the footage that you showed um, was not from the show. I mean, it wasn't really shot directly. So we took what we could. But in fact, Josephine, yes, was bare chested for that show. Um, and the reason for that being that she was asked to do so um, uh, by the producers who actually were now satisfied about um, this African-American show that they thought would be more provocative. I don't know uh, what they had in their mind. I mean, we presume they had in their mind, we actually know by now they had in their mind some sort, they, they mixed African-American with African savages uh, and they sort of, uh, in their minds, which was in the middle of, uh, you know, the French colonial uh, period, let's say, they thought that um, um, possibly uh, the jazz dancing of Josephine could possibly look like a, a savage dance or something like that. So they put Josephine, who was not necessarily a major dancer, apart. They took her apart. They had her dance. Um, uh, bare chested and she did it and it was partly a hit because of that because there's this nakedness part to it and um, uh, some, can... some people who were watching the show didn't realize she was American they actually thought she was from Africa yes of course well still um, up till today people don't in France people won't necessarily know that Josephine Baker is African-American She's a big hit, she's a big star still. She's a historical star, but people think many times that she's from Martinique or Guadeloupe or something like that, like a French Caribbean place. They won't necessarily know that she's African-American. And um, um, there, is, there are historical reasons to that. I mean, Josephine sort of embodied for the French, um, the, um, how to say, the, the person of color that, that's, uh, uh, you know the 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 black the black star. I mean, she does. She didn't really. That that was her identity, and the fact that she came bare chested almost fit into that. I mean, she was a very colonial fantasy that's put onto her. So even to up till today, sometimes it can be difficult um, to see uh, to see her beyond those stereotypes. People many times will um, say, oh, "Why do you do a film about her?" I mean, she was such a such a cliche. Mm. Um, uh, but at the time, there, were, there had been no other Black American woman who had become a kind of foreign sensation. And, and we'll talk about how she went on to become a, she, she toured Europe, she became a big star, a global star. Yes, she was much more than that. And it's, in fact, that's why I made the film is because I, I thought there was much more than that, than just that cliche, uh, that stereotype that she embodied at that moment in her life. Um, she... And at the time, you, you talk about in the film how um, the French were staging these kind of colonial exhibitions with replica exactly. African villages in Paris, where people just walk around and look at the quote-unquote villagers. 
Exactly. Well, it was exactly the same time where there was there was this sort of touring um, colonial exhibit all over France, um, where there were like in Disney, you could sort of walk into from uh, from one village to the next to see one tribe and the next, and uh, people would pose as if they were uh, in their so-called villages. And, um, and, and the French would go and visit them as if they were in their own territory, basically. And it was in this, in this kind of fantasy land that the French were, and in, in this kind of moment that um, Josephine sort of uh, took their fantasies and gave them what they wanted, but sort of distorted it in a different way that was um, much more modern. So in a way that she made herself and, um, and what they had in mind much more desirable. Um, that's exactly what her, uh, her um, how to say, um, that's why she's so interesting. And that's she why she played with the her. stereotypes. Let, let's exactly. look at an, a clip um, of, of her kind of playing with this, this idea that she, um, that she, was a, uh, she was native. This is her famous banana dance. So, so Joseph Fiam Baker was not the only African American who was in France in that period. She came over um, with a jazz band that was led by Sidney Bechet, um, and she had other friends at the time who were there as well. Well, Sidney Bechet was part of the band of La Revue Negre, um, part of the crew of, of La Revue, Revue Negre, where she 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 um, danced, she performed in the beginning. But yes, there are many many jazz men and jazz women who came to to France at the time and who settled in, in bars in, uh, in all, all around Paris, especially in the Montmartre area. area. And um, Josephine also had her own um, bar at some point. She um, actually performed in, one, in the most prestigious French venues like the Atre de Champs Elysees, etc. And that was actually where her specialty was. She actually was talking to the, um, to the most uh, to, the, to the intellectuals, the artists. It wasn't just some sort of, um, I don't know, cabaret that had the way we think about it today. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, was, uh, it's, um, it was in very prestigious theaters where she performed. And after that, she uh, had her own bar where she would, um, she would uh, dance also, perform, sing, and even cook her own home food, soul food. She even had her recipes. She was so famous that she would give her recipes to journals, to everyday journals, and people would, would want to copy uh, what, she, um, what she cooked at the restaurant or how she dressed. And uh, you know, the most famous, famous um, designers would, uh, would, would sew her clothes. The most famous photographers, like, uh, for example, Man Ray made um, uh, photos of her. Picasso thought, talked about her as a Nefertiti of her time. Uh, Hemingway went to her, um, to her bar. And um, Colette, who was a very famous French um, uh, writer, she was, was her friend. She, she would write her letters. Van Dongen, who was a, yeah, I mean, there's, there's endless kind she of artists. She was part of this whole scene was, at the time. Really, and, she, she was, yeah. and she was one of, I mean, famously, you know, there, there are many African-American uh, writers and performers and intellectuals who've come to France to escape exactly. uh, racism not, it, in the US. And, and she certainly found that in France, even though things were not at all perfect for her there. Right. Uh, exactly. It was things were not, of course, perfect. But for for the first time, she felt accepted the way she was, and that's exactly why um, a lot of uh, African Americans, the other African Americans, would stay in France. Also, it wasn't she wasn't the only one that felt so, but she was even praised for uh, for for her skin color, like for the say for the past. There there was some sort of a reverse racism, a sort of fascination. Uh, with her skin color, people, um, she even, she even uh, put out a mark called Baker's Skin that was a sort of um, uh, a fond de teint, comme on dit. Uh, like, a, like a foundation. Yeah. A foundation, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, and Baker Fix was to put her hair like Josephine and yeah. people would try to imitate her. Uh, um, and it was sort of fashionable. She, she, uh, people, uh, if, if you really push it to that part, people would say she was the first woman who made it that black is beautiful, really, even though um, she played initially on colonial fantasies. Yeah, but there was, of course, racism in France 
than a lot two. of racism. Yes. Uh, yeah. French people um, actually made exceptions for African Americans. They they still do. <laughs> they um, there's a lot there's racism in France, but um, somehow if you know on the street everyday racism like a, a black person can be uh, can be stopped on the way and asked for identity control, but if they find out that you're American, they say, oh, bien sûr, monsieur, and then you can right. move on. In many you know? different contexts, you and hear many, that exact same story. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. Same, it just goes on up till today. And that is possibly because of this history with uh, uh, African-Americans in Paris and Josephine Baker being yeah. an incarnation of that. Someone in the audience is asking a very good question in chat, and please feel free to put more questions in chat, which is, um, what is the emotional toll that it took on Josephine Baker to have to play this role of the quote unquote savage to play into stereotypes to be, even if it wasn't in the same way that she dealt with segregation in America, to be constantly dealing with how people felt about her skin. And you get into this in the film when you talk about her, her tour of um, Europe where she went to Holland, she went to all different countries and in each place she kind of played with the stereotypes of that country, but she was careful to keep playing this, this same role. Yes, well, in fact, she realized that it was a sort of a burden on her when she went on this uh, on this um, tour to Europe. Um, that's when when she start, that's when she starts to to realize what she actually is, which is a major uh, black star uh, for the whole Western world. And um, um, she that's when the first time she starts talking about herself being um, tired of always performing, of always trying to amuse people because that's what she feels like she's doing. She's sort of playing the sort of clown and trying to, but um, she actually has many um, um, ambivalent reactions. Not everywhere she goes, she's a hit. For example, in Vienna, um, there are uh, people, you know, she, there's there are petitions against her when she goes there in 1928, uh, I believe, uh, when they say, uh, you know, a priest tell people not to go see her show because there is this uh, devilish black woman who is trying to pervert them. And part of the reason is her nudity, of course, um, the banana dance, and um, uh, also because she's black. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, she's too much of a, you know, people, there is a division between the moderns and the conservatives and the moderns really do see her as a sort of um, a, re a way to get, get Europe, the European minds to open up, um, a way to modernize Europe, uh, to see something else behind. Um, they, they see actually the banana dance as a sort of a, a fantasy to make fun of. And um, even when you see uh, in Paris in particular, Paris is particular for that, but uh, in Berlin also, there is a lot of fascination about on, on African-Americans and Josephine is really the, uh, the embodiment of all, all of that fascination. And, but that is precisely when she starts um, during that trip, she realizes that it can be a burden. And in fact, when she comes back to, to, to Paris, um, a couple of years later, she, um, um, she there, there are some moments when she decides to change a little bit also. She starts taking on the, some more singing and some more opera. Yeah. And, uh, well, but still, that being said, it's a hit everywhere she goes. Yeah. She, but she, but just so Josephine is, there are some stumbling blocks, but she's a big success in Europe. But she, of course, wants to go back home and be successful mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. she, um, she, she gets a, she organizes some performances back in, I think it's New York and she goes back to America. And the first thing that happens is she tries to check into a hotel in New York and the clerk at the hotel will not give her a room because she's black. Exactly. So it's sort of confrontation again with the reality of racism in, and segregation in America. Well, she thought, she sort of thinks that because she's a star um, as a star, she also had the impression in Europe that she was able to change mentalities about black people in a way as being a, a star. Um, when she went back to New York, she thought that as a star, she would escape racism and it was um, not true at all. Um, not only was she treated as a star because she was seen as a, as a sort of a, a little actress who mysteriously achieve power, uh, achieve success in, in, in Europe. And they people felt that she, she didn't deserve that much success. 
um, but also not also as, as as a regular as a regular person. She wasn't accept, accepted to uh, hotels because she was black. She went back to uh, stay in Harlem, um, and um, she took it really as a you know she realized that 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 she. I don't know. I think she she that was a major major breakthrough in her life. That's actually when um, um, that's that's why we well I, I try to make the film I try to base the base the film on her returns to the United States because those are her major um, confrontations with the reality. Yeah, that's when but, she makes major decisions in her life. In each but, time, but also I think you focus on what happens when you also focus on what happens after that when she comes back to France and. Uh, she, she comes back to a France that's entering the war. And I imagine that at that point, she had been married to a Frenchman, Frenchman she got French citizenship at some point. She had to give up her American uh, citizenship at that not time. Yet, not, or, no, not yet. Not mm -hmm. yet, but mm -hmm. she's becoming more and more French. And then when the war starts, she joins the French resistance. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what she did for the resistance? Well, um, the major thing that she did was that Josephine was such a, um, such a star that she could travel everywhere um, besides of the all the she could cross borders um, easily so she uh, having them check all her all everything that she was carrying exactly mm. so she took an assistant that was uh, not really her assistant who was uh, number two of the secret services who had joined the resistance um, who asked to be uh, who, who made them both um, fake papers uh, fake passport um, well, for himself, fake passport as an as an assistant, and she traveled with him so that he could carry documents and information from um, you know Portugal to France, for, to Spain and Italy. Um, so and she, she would go to parties and try to collect intelligence in the for, you know pretending she was just chatting with people, but then she would transmit everything that she exactly. learned from these conversations. And she says, well, she carried information in her bras, and um, and she also with uh, with invisible ink, she had um, information written on her petitions, so she could uh, at some point when he couldn't travel, when her assistant couldn't travel, she traveled alone and carried information. Yeah, that and was she the, on. Go ahead. Uh, that that was the the things she did during the during the, before before 1943 before the Allies uh, the, before the American troops arrived to to North Africa. Um, that's when she was a, a spy. But during the war, then she was. It was a big moment for her because she felt like, she, well, um, it could have been possibly because she um, she decided to do something for the for the for the well she says it's because uh, she wanted to do something for the for the country that saved her uh, but she also was pro pro possibly trying to um, position herself differently for uh, as a as a as a more of an activist mm -hmm. um, we have her um, some footage of her performing for american troops who right. i think were in morocco uh, that, by leaving america she became a sort of transnationalist well, she she put all her energies to fight against Nazism, and that was very important for her. Um, uh, but she also felt like um, she could unite everyone around one cause. Like she wanted to create a sort of community um, around her cause. So she traveled uh, through. Um, yeah, she actually um, made g gave many concerts between. Uh, uh, Morocco and Syria. She traveled, even though she was very ill during that time, actually. Um, and uh, she um, she gave all the money she collected from the concerts to the Free French Army. Um, that's why she was um, seen as a French heroine at that time after the war. When um, and yeah, she got the Legion of Honor eventually, and exactly. she was really honored for her service. Exactly, her she friend. was really seen as a, as one of the major figures. Of um, of the resistance. Yeah, but then you know, I ironically, she goes back to America after the war, and um, she has this kind of new political courage. And I think this is when she said um, she's not going to perform anywhere that black people are not at any clubs where black people are not allowed in. She rejected segregation. She was she sort of took on the role of trying to change things back in America. And she was really kind of harped that, that she was rejected by America. 
This was the point well, where they banned there, her there many, back to the US. Right, there are many steps to that. First, first she goes back. She really thinks that uh, things will change now that the war was won against the Nazis. And then she realized that American uh, racism in America had not changed at all because the same thing exactly happened again. She was refused a hotel room because she was with her white husband and um, people could be shocked to see a mixed couple. So um, that's when she, she went back to, for the first time actually in 25 years, she decided to go back to um, the South where she had, where she's from. And that's when she saw again that segregation was still there and that things had not changed since she was, uh, she was, she had left the United States. And that's why she realized that she could do much more than just come and perform in New York and go back and that she could, she should also fight for that. I mean, she was, it was a big deception actually to, to, to see that, um, you know, I, she was, Josephine was very naive. She, she thought that, uh, uh, you know, the United States fighting against the Nazis was systematically meant that they would also question their own race relations, right? Um, so, um, but in fact, the Nazis were inspired by segregation in the American South. <laughs> Well, yeah. So, uh, so she um, she decided to to come back to France and to never go back to the United States unless unless she would assure, assure that she would be um, uh, that she and her band and her audiences would not be segregated, and then she started to put that in her contracts every time she would be she would be invited, and that's what happened a few years later, nineteen fifty one. She was reinvited, and this time she negotiated her contract. And her first concert was actually in Florida, uh, where there was a mixed mixed audience for the first time in Florida's history. Wow, was that in Miami? Miami. Oh wow! Right. We didn't find a footage for that particular event, but, <laughs> That's but she went I'm on from Miami, there. so I would love to, <laughs> yes. love to see that. Um, yeah. But Josephine does decide that she's going to start her own kind of. I, idyllic community in France in the, she had bought a chateau in the Dordogne and she began very quickly adopting a lot of children. Um, someone had asked about this in the, in the chat. She called it her rainbow family. She, if I have this right, she adopted 12 children 12 from 12 children. different yeah. countries. Exactly. Well, she, well, that's a, the, the idea of, of, of that came because, well, first of all, during when she was ill in Morocco during the war, she had uh, lost her, uh, she uh, had, she was ill and she couldn't have babies anymore. That was uh, one major thing in her life that happened then. Then when she, she went back to the United States and what happened during that time when she was actually going from city to city, uh, performing and also creating scandals everywhere she, she went, if, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, one of her, the black people in her uh, in her band wasn't accepted to the hotel, or and she would create scandals about that, or about anything that was happening happening in the country regarding in regards to segregation. She was uh, she was talking out loud about um, you know uh, she was very loud about it. And, and how many how point, many children did she adopt? I'm sorry, I'm 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 yeah. getting to that. But okay. <laughs> she was so loud. She was so loud that she at some point the FBI started a case against her and threatening her to not be able to back, go back to the United States. So she her cancel all her concert, con concerts in Latin America were canceled and everything. She came back to France very deceived about her wanting to change the mentalities, right? This is in the 1950s. So she, basically, if I'm Josephine Baker, I would be thinking, okay, I couldn't change the United States, but I'm going to change the world anyway. I'm going to create my own little world, I, idyllic, utopic world, and I'm going to adopt children from all over the world and uh, create um, a, sort of a sort of replica of a small <laughs> um, universe in my own house. She already had her, her, her chateau in the Dordogne, which is in the center of France. And that's when she decided to adopt 12 children. Well, four in the beginning, but uh, she couldn't stop herself from adopting more and more every time she went to travel for her concerts. She, could, she would come back with, uh, with a new child. Um, but they were they were all boys. Why was that? Most of them were boys. Well, she said at some point that it was because she didn't want to um, uh, them to her children to intermarry. 
uh, to yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, she adopted um, ten boys at the beginning. At some point, she couldn't find boys. She adopted girls. And some of uh, those children, many of those children, are still alive. Yes, Did you interview of any them of them are still or... alive. Yes, yes, yes. They actually were. Uh, they were all at the premiere in 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 Paris when we did the premiere. Yeah, they they all came. That she did this, but I mean, she, was she, it, it sort of seems like a stunt. But was she really like a, a mother to all of these children? Yes. Yes, she was actually. She was she was traveling a lot, but still, she is she she. They have a very tender tender memories of her, um, even though she had to travel a lot to um, to do a lot of concerts everywhere for that to raise that family in her chateau. She actually brought over her family from Saint Louis. Also, she brought her mother to the chateau, and her sister and her husband. Who couldn't have children either so she adopted for them as well <laughs> she adopted an indian child as well so uh, it was a major major colony um uh in chateau de milan who is which is actually today um josephine baker museum so you can go visit um actually um it's a pretty good museum but she ran out of money and had to sell the chateau at one exactly. point. Exactly. So she acted at that point. At some point, she had to. She ran out of money and she had to sell the chateau for no money at all. Um, well, uh, that was a very sort of uh, everyday uh, news item for many years until uh, you know in the late sixties until uh, you know seventy uh, until yeah in the late sixties mostly. Uh, that B Josephine Baker should be supported and Brigitte Bardot would make television statements saying that she should be supported and at the end um, uh, when she had to give it up um, um, pr Princess G Grace Kelly gave her um, an apartment in Monaco uh, so but she moved she, with all the, the rainbow tribe to Monaco over that, right so she had um, to sell wh why what was her relationship with Princess Grace how did they know each other Oh, she they were celebrities. I mean, they were everyone in <laughs> each other. She was, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so Josephine um, continued her political activism uh, up to the point where, in 1963, she was invited to speak at the with Martin Luther King Jr. at, at the March on Washington. And in fact, she was the only woman who was asked to speak. Right, she um, she was she went back to the United States in 1963. I think the best is just to show the the clip, and then maybe we can talk about that. Okay, I'm gonna put it up. This is Josephine Baker at the March on Washington. It, it was a very right. short speech. <laughs> yes, it's a short speech, but that is that being said, she's still there, and. Um, what is interesting about that is that she's wearing the the uniform of the Free French Army <laughs> for the Washington March, and um, you know she, I think, kept an idea of um, uh, France as an idyllic, you know, land where where black people will would be welcome, and she wanted she, her idea, even though it's an it, we see it as a you know it's for us in France it's sort of a fantasy, even though compared to the United States, of course, we understand why she felt that way. I mean, there's no, you know, no doubt about that. But um, so she she wanted to probably make a point about France being um, sort of uh, with um, French values being, uh, you know, desirable. And, um, and uh, but it also gave her credibility, I think, to, to Americans that she had had this foreign experience and was 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 coming was kind of returning with it. Exactly. The wisdom of France rep and representing the French ideals. Exactly, exactly. That's what Margot Jefferson, who is one of our, our, our interviewees, um, says Margot Jefferson, who is a, a, a theater critic, who was a theater, theater critic for the New York Times, uh, she, that she comes as an emissary and that is very important for people symbolically that she was, she's there. Uh, people, we have a bunch of uh, questions in chat from members of our audience. Um, yes. One of them is, how did she lose her money? What went wrong? Oh, well, she was making, to, she was living like a princess and she doesn't have the mean to do that. She was, uh, she, she had 12 children. She was living in a chateau. Chateau is like a big chateau in the middle of France. It's costed a lot of money. And she was, um, 
uh, at the, by the end of her life, she was sort of recycling her repertoire um, of the good old days between uh, before the war. Um, so um, I think she wasn't really uh, a star as she used to be anymore. And uh, when, when she, was, uh, she was younger, she was very well known, but she was no longer the star that she was in the 1920s. She was so her really... act didn't really evolve um, as she got older. Sorry? Her act, the, her performances didn't really evolve. They didn't really change well, that much. She always had a nostalgia repertoire. Like she was always singing the song, the song that you, you, you saw, uh, J'ai deux, deux amours, uh, mon, pays, mon pays c'est Paris. That was her song. Everyone knew that song. Uh, she had a lot of uh, very songs. I mean, she, Josephine Baker was not necessarily um, known with her. Um, she has she has amazing songs. I think one of one the best album I've seen of her is an album is the albums that she made in the 1920s. Really, later on, I think she sort of became a sort of a variété. A, 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 she had a. a uh, she was recycling really what yeah. she had done and people were uh, were excited about that too i mean that is not that, that's not to degrade her in any way i mean people were really excited to see her and they, they did have this nostalgia of this period before the war um that was very free um and and she was a femme libre yeah. the famous femme libre in france a free woman that's sort of the highest level of womanhood here Exactly. Well, people would say when well, one of again, Margaret Jefferson says that she's she's sort of the the um, the like quintessence. I don't know how to say that. Um, sort the of quintessence, the, the ultimate, the, yeah. the ultimate. Um, you know, a modern woman that sort of uh, at the time that was you know that sort of uh, goes into a place and starts singing and dress modern and and she dresses sometimes as a man, sometimes as a woman. She goes on the streets with her leopard, uh, you know, with her domesticated leopard, and and she's naked, but she's most fashionable. She can be if she wants. She can be naked if she wants. She can be very fashionable, and it, it, these are the kind of. Um, um, sort of modern womanhood things that seem. But she sort of always remained later. seductive. I think that's Sorry? also a key. She always remained kind of seductive too. So that was, always, that was key exactly. to the, their admiration for her. I, I want to just remind everyone of the name of your film. It's uh, Josephine Baker, The Story of an Awakening. Um, it's been shown all over the world. You've made it first for Arte, which is a French German channel in France. Um, and, and then you ended up touring it all over the world. How did the French uh, respond to the film? What was the response here? Well, um, I think the French had never, I mean, but that, that's my opinion about how it was seen in France. <laughs> but um, well, friend, the French had a very dusted idea of her. They, she, were, they either, she was really either, either seen as like a banana dancer, that was sort of a little bit uh, old fashionable, almost degrading image. Or um, or uh, or this uh, you know uh, woman, this mother of the of uh, the Rainbow Tribe, which is also uh, a dusted image because people were sick of seeing her and her chateau losing her chateau for many years every day on the news. I think so. There, there was a lot of dust to take out of her story to see how modern she was, yeah. uh, and that she was also the first black star in history, and that she that it came in France. So people actually are, are surprised, I think, to discover her with that perspective. And that's what we actually try to do in the documentary is try to tell the story from her perspective and to juxtapose to, to juxtapose, how, yeah. people <laughs> saw her, how people saw her and how she saw what, how, what, how people saw her. So that's what we try to do. It was sort of uh, going back and forth in between uh, you know, the image that she she projected and how she saw that image and how she dealt with that. Um, being a black star was really not necessarily um, the most easy task in the world. <laughs> and um, she was the first one to do it. 